This is my flood salvage Mercedes S-Class that I went through in part one of this series, and I determined that it wasn't actually in a flood. In fact, it seems like it was really well taken care of for its entire life. So in this video, I'm gonna go through and replace every single fluid and filter in it. Well, except for the fuel, and the windshield washer fluid, and the blinker fluid. UPS just stopped by and dropped off three big beautiful boxes of fluids, filters, and more good stuff. Start out by draining the engine oil. I have a feeling this is gonna hit the subframe and make a really big mess. Nope. All right, well, here's the oil draining. I'm hoping those shiny particles are just left over from the Land Rover. <laughs> I did use this for that last, so that definitely could be why it looks shiny in there. Well, otherwise the oil looks fine. It's just oil, there's no water in there. While I'm waiting for the oil to drain, I figure I'll start draining the coolant since this usually takes a little while. Probably have to open up the uh, coolant reservoir to relieve the vacuum pressure. Okay, that's better. This system is actually pretty nice because it doesn't make a mess. So I'm really happy about that. Okay, transmission. That's really tight. Probably have a little bit of fluid come out now, but not a lot because there's a little um, fill tube that needs to be removed. Oh, oh, excuse you. Yep, I can see there's a little green tube in there. Hey, that was easy. Oh, ho, 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 man, that was clumsy. The date on the oil filter is November of 2021, which is awesome. That actually means I probably didn't need to do this, but I'm still glad that I did. Make sure you clean your oil pan out nicely, clean the magnets over there if your pan has them, and also we'll install a new fill tube here. Got a genuine Mercedes filter. Okay, new gasket. These bolts are supposed to be replaced. They're aluminum and they are torque to yield. It's kind of dumb, but whatever, that's what they did. So the torque spec is four Newton meters plus 180 degrees. That's four right there. Also, don't forget to drain your torque converter. Now, before I can set the proper transmission fluid level, I have to run the engine, which means it would probably be a good idea to fill it up with coolant and oil first. What a weird looking oil filter. Liquimoly 5W40, I love this stuff, and it's so nice to pour with this bottle too. You don't even need a funnel. Filling a Mercedes transmission does require a special pump because you have to fill it through the drain plug. It's, it's kind of a weird procedure, but it's totally doable. It's really not too bad. It sort of encourages you to have multiple Mercedes so that you get the most out of your special tool. Step one is to install this adapter here, and then I can attach my pump directly to that. Now I can pump away open up this valve and fill this thing up with fluid. At this point, I should be able to start it up and let the fluid warm up to temperature. All right, so I put it in reverse, neutral, and drive and back into park. That circulates fluid through the valve body. And now I'm just running this and waiting for the oil temperature to reach 45 degrees Celsius at which point I can disconnect this, fluid will come out, and then when it starts to become just a drip, then I quickly put the drain plug in and it should be the right level. 
yeah, it's a really weird process, but it is what it is. Much later. All right, we're at 44 degrees. The radiator fan came on, which is why it's so loud. All right, 45. Screw this quickly. And that's a trickle, I think. So put the plug in. A little bit messy, but easy as pie. To change the brake fluid, I first need to empty the brake fluid reservoir so I can fill it with clean fluid. A pressure bleeder makes the process very easy. Got my magnetic brake bleeder bottle, stick it on there, attach this to the bleed screw. The bleed screw is an 11 millimeter, because why not? Open that up, see the fluid come out, and basically I can wash this fluid until it becomes clear, and then close it up, and this side is done. It can be hard to tell because the fluid changes so gradually, but I think that fluid looks pretty clean to me. Go ahead and close this bleed screw. One down and three to go. Okay, rear differential, we have the drain plug right there, but I am gonna remove the fill plug first, which is right up there. Okay, this thing's in the way, so I can't actually get a ratchet on the back of this socket, so I'm gonna use a wrench like this. Ugh. I'll put this back in for now, just to keep it from dripping fluid. Now that I got the drain plug off, I know that I'm not gonna have any trouble filling this thing back up after I drain it. Oh, that's tight. Ugh. Oh, it does look somewhat metallic in there, which, you know, that is kind of common for differentials that never get changed, but. Yeah, I'm glad I'm changing it, that's for sure. I'm gonna use a 75W85, which is what Mercedes recommends for fuel economy, because obviously you buy a big heavy S-Class with a twin turbo V8 for fuel economy. I left this fluid inside so that it would stay at room temperature and it makes it a lot easier to pump because it's pretty cold out. Okay, that's full. Ooh, that's very full. Torque spec on this is 50 Newton meters, which is right about, click, click, that. Okay, so the front differential is not quite as easy. The drain plug is right here, which is nice, but unfortunately it doesn't have a fill plug. What you're supposed to do is remove the right CV shaft here and then you can fill it through that hole. But unfortunately, that means you have to take off the steering knuckle and there's a lot of stuff to disconnect over here. Now, over here on the other side, I do have to fix this CV boot. So I do have to take all this apart to fix that. That's pretty important. So I'm gonna do this first and we'll see what it's like and then I'll think about doing that side over there. Also, this control arm is the one that I showed in the last video that has a little bit of play in the ball joint. So I have to replace this anyway. And the other side has no play in it, so that one should be good. If you're working on a Mercedes, don't forget your external torque set. Pretty much every bolt on it is external torques. This one is an E24. I'll put a link in the description. the size of this brake caliper. Wow. <laughs> that is a heavy brake disc too. Whew. Oh, that came off really easily. Oh, huh. Why is everything coming apart so easily on this vehicle? Is it a Mercedes thing? This is the bad one. Oh, hey, there we go. No need to undo the stuff on the top here. Should have access now. There it is.
Let's use a brass punch here. Won't this thing come apart? I do not know what's wrong with this thing, but I cannot get this outer CV joint off. I've even tried using a four pound engineer's hammer and it won't budge. In the meantime, over here on the other side, I went ahead and got the other CV shaft out. If you look in there, you can see the hole where I will fill up the differential. Oh. That fluid doesn't look too bad. It is dark. I don't see any metal, any noticeable amount of metal in it. 20 Newton meters, click, click. So I gotta get this hose inside the differential and pump away. All right, oil's just starting to drip out there, so I think it's full. New CV axle just came in, so let's get it installed. The next order of business is to change the spark plugs, which is due at the 120,000 mile service. Everything was going well, and it seemed like this was going to be an easy task until... I got the first ignition coil out, and look at the shape of it. This suggests that the spark plugs might be pretty tricky to access, and not only that, but the ignition coil itself was very difficult to remove. <sighs> Okay, so you take a snap-on 17 millimeter wrench and you can sort of stick it on here and pry it out and you might need your other hand to get in there and pull as well. These things are tricky to get out. Okay, well I ended up getting all of the coil packs and boots off and I did end up breaking some of the boots. Luckily these are separate from the coil packs themselves. The coil packs are very expensive to replace. The boots themselves are like 10 bucks a piece, so I recommend ordering a new set of these. I ordered a new set of eight and they are OEM Mercedes parts. The spark plugs turned out to be easy to remove with the use of a magnetic swivel socket. Link in description. The spark plugs themselves are like almost completely horizontal, so once you get this in there, you can just use a regular ratchet. Old spark plugs definitely look used, but they look okay. The old spark plugs are OEM Mercedes plugs and cost about $24 a piece, but the new ones I bought appear to be made in the same factory and only cost $9 a piece, a huge savings. Okay, torque spec for the new spark plugs, 23 Newton meters, and that feels about right. Not too tight, but snug. Okay, so new coil pack extensions, they just snap on like so. And then this end over here that goes on the spark plug, that white stuff is already some sort of lubricant, maybe like a silicone grease or a dielectric grease. This is really thoughtful on the part of Mercedes. And then it pops onto place over the spark plug real easily. Very nice. While I'm in here, it's a good time to change the air filters. All right, that's definitely worth changing. Can't forget to change the cabin air filters. So we go in. Ew, that's a little bit nasty. Oh, oh my God, there's so much crap falling out of here. Into the floor of the vehicle. Look at all that. Well, this was really due to be changed. Okay, there we go, new filters in place. All right, let's start it up and hopefully everything works. Other than all that beeping, it looks like everything's good.
Well, after that service, I feel even more confident that this vehicle has a lot of life left in it, and it is ready to go in now for its state police salvage inspection. Thank you to you guys in the comments for letting me know how interested you are in seeing that. I also found out in the comments, thanks to one of you guys, that I might have a hard time getting this thing inspected because I live in New Hampshire and I bought it in the state of New York, which is a little bit special when it comes to things like this. It seems like the state of New York doesn't actually want any other states to be able to inspect salvage vehicles from New York for whatever reason maybe they want the revenue from that but basically they issue a salvage certificate rather than a salvage title and as it turns out a lot of states don't accept that salvage certificate as proof of ownership so I guess in part three of this series we'll find out if I can get this thing successfully inspected in the state of New Hampshire or if I have to bring it to New York or if I can't get it inspected at all a bunch of you guys in the comments wanted to know what the story is with this, my parts vehicle, and the reason why I picked this up is because it has a really rare option, which I really wanted, and uh, anyway, I can be a little bit spontaneous. I woke up in the morning, I was on the computer, decided to check out the auction site, see what's going on, and I saw this with the option that I really wanted, and it's really hard to find, all the way down in Virginia. I decided to put a low bid on it, and I won it. Now going into this, I saw that it had some body damage over in that corner over there. The air suspension isn't working. I went into this expecting that I was going to have to put some money into it and fix it, but it's probably worth it with the rare option. Unfortunately, after I drove all the way down to Virginia to pick this thing up and I saw this in person for the first time, I saw that it has a lot more damage on it than really showed up in the pictures. And I'm not going to name names, but the auction company that sold this is pretty bad when it comes to pictures. And actually, they're bad for a lot of other reasons too, but I'm not going to get into that. It needs a bunch of new body panels, more than I planned on. There's body damage on the rear quarter panel that I didn't see, which means I actually need to do body work on it and paint it rather than just bolting on new panels panels, which is what I like to try to get away with. Also, it's filled with water in the inside with mold growing on it, so it's got water leaks. Now, as far as the engine is concerned, it's a big unknown because this vehicle didn't come with a key, which I knew going into it, but it would cost me 420 or so dollars at the dealer to buy a key just so I can start it up and see if the engine runs well. And the problem there is that I found two big bottles of coolant in the trunk, one of which was mostly empty, which tells me that this thing has a coolant leak, probably. Now, I don't know if the coolant leak is something easy to fix, like maybe just a bad radiator or a leaky hose, or if it's something big, like a blown head gasket, cracked cylinder head, cracked block even, and those are big issues that I don't really want to have to deal with. With all of those unknowns about this vehicle, plus the fact that the interior is not in particularly good shape, the previous owner had his kids in it and they beat the crap out of this thing. So I just decided it's really not worth fixing this thing up. It cost me $2,600, which it is cheap for one of these. So I figured I'd just write it off as a loss or maybe use it as a parts vehicle. And of course, when I found my flood salvage vehicle, I figured, oh, well, I have a parts vehicle. So if it has damaged electronics, I can swap these into my flood salvage vehicle to repair it. Oh, as far as the options that this thing has, it has Night View Assist Plus, which is something that I've wanted ever since these cars were new, and I've always thought it was a really cool feature. It's basically an infrared camera facing forward, and it displays that on the LCD display of the instrument cluster, and it highlights people or animals that are on or next to the road. It's basically a safety feature that I've always thought was really cool, and I've kind of always wanted one of these cars with that option. Other options that this thing has, it's got four zone climate control, rear side window sunshades, the seats in the back actually recline and they probably have the massaging feature as well. And it also has a sunroof in the back. This car is basically specced out for you to ride in the back of it and have someone drive you around. It really is a shame that this thing was abused so badly because otherwise it's such a cool car. Anyway, keep your eyes open for part three of this series where I go through the state police salvage inspection process and get this vehicle back on the road and of course bring you guys with me. I'm finally expecting the ownership documentation for this vehicle to come in next week, which means then I can go ahead and schedule the inspection and go through that whole process, which might take a little while, so don't expect the video out anytime soon. Thanks for watching.